Greetings to you all my beloved grade 12 learners. In this video, I will be answering March 2019 common test. Uh, the subject is accounting and this is for grade 12 learners. So the paper is out of 100 marks and the learners are given one hour to finish the paper. So without waste of time, let us go straight to the question. So we have question one which is out of 47 marks and learners are given 28 minutes to finish this uh, question. So 28 minutes is the time allocated for question one. So in this question, we are tested on income statement and audit reports. We have the information regarding Mutu Limited. So the information related to Mutu Limited for the financial year ended 28th Feb 2019. So guys, the financial year end is 28th Feb 2019. So it's very important to note the beginning and end of financial period. So this period starts on the 1st of March 2018 and ends on the last day of Feb 2019. 19. So this is our financial period. Then we have required section. And under required, we have 1.1 and 1.2. So 1.1, we are required to prepare the statement of comprehensive income. So this is um, income statement. So we are required to prepare the income statement for the year ended. 28th Feb 2019. And guys, this is out of 40 marks. So we're going to prepare the income statement. So now let us analyze the information that we have in the trial balance. So we are given information A, which is the trial balance. So this is an extract from the pre adjustment trial balance on the 28th of Feb 20. 19. So guys, remember we are required to prepare the statement of comprehensive income. So when preparing the statement of comprehensive income, we focus um, on this section, nominal account section. So under nominal account section, you will find your income and expenses. So under this section, we are given the sales balance. So we have sales of 8,750,500. And cost of sales, the balance is not given. So we're going to cal calculate this balance. Uh, in the very same trial balance, we are given the debtor's allowance of 2,500. Guys, we always subtract the debtor's allowance from sales. So we're going to adjust this balance on sales figure. So we always subtract the debtor's allowance. And we are given director's fees, which is an expense. We have audit fees. This is also an expense. Salaries and contributions. It is an expense. We have rent income. So this one is an income account. We have interest on fixed deposits. This is an income. We are given the insurance balance. So this one is an expense. Bad debts. It is an expense. Packing material. This is an expense. Depreciation is an expense but the amount or the balance is not given. Lastly, we have ordinary shared dividends. So this one, guys, they just put uh, this one, you know, to confuse you. So this is interim dividends. So we do not record dividends in the statement of comprehensive income. So we're gonna ignore this 340,000. So now we are moving to the next one. So it's information B now. So here we are told that the business prices its goods at a markup of 50% on cost. So guys, this information, we're going to use it to calculate the cost of sales. So we're going to adjust the sales figure and then we take the adjusted sales figure. Uh, we apply the markup on that figure so that we get the correct cost of sales. So... I hope, guys, um, you understand this part. So I will show you the formula that we're going to use to calculate the cost of sales using the markup. I will show you the formula. So trade discount 
of 360,000 was allowed on invoices to certain customers. So guys, we have discount that uh, we have allowed to certain customers. So guys, discount is a cost to us because if we give out, if we give out a discount to customers, uh, we do not receive the full amount. So it is a cost to us. So this one uh, also affects the cost of sales because this is a cost that we incur as we try to attract customers to come and buy from us. So I told you that I will show you the formula. So now let me show this formula. And after this, we're going to move on to the next um, part of additional information. So guys, this is the formula that we use to calculate the cost of sales if we are given the markup percentage. So what we do, we take the adjusted sales figure. If it happens that in the question, you are given discount allowed, you add that discount, and then you multiply by 100 over 100 plus markup. So we know our markup percentage is 50%. So our denominator here will be 150. So guys, it's not always the case whereby you will be given the discount. So if the discount is not given, you simply take the adjusted sales figure, you multiply it by 100 over 100 plus markup percentage. You only add discount granted or discount allowed if this is given in the question. Like in this question that we are doing, we are told that the business is giving um, out a discount to customers, to certain customers. So there is trade discount of 360,000 that is allowed on invoices to certain customers. So since the business gives um, the discount to customers, we're gonna add this 360 discount on top of the adjusted sales figure. So I hope this is understood. Now let us do um, information C. Goods sold on credit for 75,000 was not recorded. So guys, we have sales that uh, were not recorded. So guys, remember in the statement of comprehensive income, we record both cash and credit sales. So this 75,000 relate to credit sales that were made by the business to customers. So we made sales on credits to the value of 75,000. And the issue here is these sales were not uh, recorded. So ours is to record this uh, sales amount. So guys, now I think we have sufficient information to adjust our sales figure. So the given sales figure in the trial balance is 8,750,500. And I told you that we always subtract debtors allowance from sales. So the debtors allowance is 2,500. So now we are doing our workings. So we have 8,750,500. From that in, this is the balance given in the trial balance, and then we subtract the debtors allowance of 2500. Guys, we are told in part C of information, additional information, we are told that um, sales to the value of 75,000, which we made on credit, were never recorded. So now we are recording. So how do we record? We add the 75,000. So now we're going to use our calculator to get the adjusted sales value. So we have 8 million. We have 8,750,500, we subtract 20,500, we capitalize 75,000. So the adjusted sales figure is 8,805,000. So we have 8,805,000. So guys, now we have the adjusted sales uh, balance. So now let us calculate the cost of sales. So already I've explained the formula here. Now we are applying the formula. So we said we're going to take the adjusted sales figure. So the adjusted sales figure is the one that we have just calculated here. So the adjusted sales figure is 8,805,000. So and then in this question, we have discount that was granted, discount allowed. So the amount for discount granted is 360. So we're gonna capitalize this uh, amount of 360. So we add 360,000. Then we multiply this 
500. So we multiply this 500 over. Guys, remember the markup is 50. So just to confirm, the markup is 50 percent. So we're gonna have 110 50 as our denominator. So it's 100 plus markup of 50. So 100 plus 50, that is 110 50. Then we can put the division line here. And now we're gonna punch or we're gonna use our calculator to get the correct cost of sales balance. So now let us use the calculator. So we're gonna open the brackets eight million eight hundred and five triple zero. We capitalize discount of three sixty. We close the brackets and we multiply this by the fraction of 100 over 150. So I'm getting 6,110,000. So this is the balance for cost of sales, 6,110,000. So guys, now we have the cost of sales figure. So now we're gonna put this balance here. So guys, we can show workings. So 8805 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, so it's adjusted sales at discount and then you multiply by 100 over 150 which is um the markup percentage and then the balance is six million hundred and ten so guys remember we always put cost of sales in brackets so six million hundred and ten ten thousand so sales minus cost of sales is the gross profit so the, the difference between sales and cost of sales is the gross profits eight million eight hundred and five triple zero minus six one ten triple zero i'm getting two six nine five triple zero so this is the gross profits so gross profits is two million six nine five triple zero and then i will read the next um adjustment a delta p zulu with an outstanding balance of 42,000 has left the country and his account must be written off so there is this data by the name p zulu so this data has left the country and he never paid us the balance of 42,000. so now we can't trace him anymore because he has left the country so what should we do with the balance that is owing to us so the balance needs to be written off so guys this will create a bad debt so we're gonna have a bad debt of 42,000. so we're gonna capitalize this under this line item of bad debts so initially we had a balance of 6.7 and now we are capitalizing the balance of 42,000 which is the balance that Pizulu never paid us. So we are done. We are now on additional information E. The provision for bad debt must be adjusted to 5% of the outstanding debtors. So guys, we're gonna calculate the outstanding debtors balance and on that balance, we're gonna apply the five percent. So now the question is, how do we get the outstanding debtors balance? So we are going straight to the trial balance and the balance sheet section. So we have this section, balance sheet section. So under this section, we're gonna look for the debtors control balance. So we have the debtors control balance here, which is 186. So this is the balance that uh, our debtors are owing us. So this balance has not been adjusted so to get the outstanding data's balance we're going to adjust this data's control balance so how do we do it so pay attention so we are calculating the outstanding data's 
balance. So when calculating this balance, we take the debtors control balance. In this case, we said the balance is 186. So we got this balance from the child balance, debtors control balance 186. So guys, remember, we have these um, sales that we made on credit, that is part C of additional information. So we are told here that we made the sales on credit. So guys, credit sales give rise to debtors. So because we have sold on credit, it means someone is now owing us. So because these sales were made on credit, we must uh, record this 75,000 in the debtors journal, or we must add this to the debtors list. So 75,000. So now we are having more debtors because we have sold on credit. So guys, you should know that credit sales always give rise to debtors. So in this balance, and we are told that this was not recorded in the trial balance, about, in, the, in, the, in the given trial balance. So now we're gonna add 75,000 because this will increase the value of our debtors. So every time we make sales on credit, our debtors balance increase. And then there is this one data who left the country. So his balance of 42,000 was recorded, but now we can't trace this person because he has left the country. So we must write off his account. So we must cancel his debt. So this 42,000 is included in the 186,000 that is given in the trade balance. So now because the person has to be written off, we must cancel his debt. So we subtract 42,000 because we have told ourselves that no, it's okay. Uh, we will no longer receive the 42,000 because the person has left the country without paying us. So now we are canceling his balance. So now that's how we get the outstanding debtors balance. So how much is the outstanding debtors balance? So now we're going to use the calculator. 186, this is from the trial balance. We add 75,000 credit sales minus 42,000. So the outstanding balance is 210. 19,000. And we are told that the provision for bad debt must be adjusted to 5%. So we multiply this by 5%. So we multiply this by 5%. Then we're going to have the adjusted provision. So 219 times 5%. So now the adjusted provision is 10,950. So this is the adjusted provision. So this is the amount that we are now assuming that we will not receive from our data. So now there is a given balance in the trial balance. So there is a given provision in the trial balance. So in the trial balance, we have the provision for bad debt of 12,000. So initially, we estimated that uh, 12,050 is the amount that we will not receive from our debtors. But after making the adjustment, we have now discovered that no, the actual amount that we will not receive from our debtors is 10,950. So now let us check um, on the trend. So we can see here that the provision for bad debt has decreased. So initially, it was 12,050. So initially, we had the provision so given provision so initially we had the provision of 12050 and now we have the adjusted provision so the adjusted provision is the one that we have just um, calculated the one that we have just adjusted so the adjusted one is 10950 so guys, the provision for bad debt has decreased from 12,050 to 10,950. So it has decreased by how much? So now we find the difference. So we subtract these two balances so that we get the difference. So 12,050 minus 10,950. So the difference is 1.1. So the provision has decreased by 1.1, 1, 1,100. So now, is this an income or an expense? So guys, if there is a decrease in the provision, you always record that as an income. So let me write it for you. A decrease 
in the provision for bad debts is an income. And an increase in the provision of bad debts is an expense. So this one, guys, is an income because the provision has decreased from 12 to 0 0.50 to 10 9.50 and it has decreased by 1,100. So now we are going to income section. We have operating income section. Now we are adding provision. Provision. For bad debts. So guys, we show workings. So 12 to 0.50 minus 10.950. And then the difference is 1.1. Then we are moving on to the next one. So now we are going to parts F of additional information. So let us read this one, part F. The rent income was increased by 10% from 1 November 2018. So the rent increment took effect on the 1st of November 2018. So we should take note of this date. The tenant has not paid the rent for Feb 2019. So the tenant hasn't paid for Feb 2019. So the balance that is given in the trial balance is for how many months? It's for 11 months. Because we are told that the tenant hasn't paid for Feb. So the tenant has paid from March to January. So the rent for Feb is still outstanding so the rent that is given in the, in the trial balance is for 11 months and the balance that the customer has paid for 11 months is 67 800 so now we can see that before november there was no increase in the rent income so for how many months from march to october so that is one two three four five six seven eight so for eight months there was no increase so the increase started on the 1st of November. So before November, there was no increase. So now let us solve this, guys. Now I want us to solve this. So in the trial balance, we are given 67,800. So we said this 67,800 is for 11 months because we haven't received the rent for FEP. So there's still an outstanding uh, rent for FEP. So 67 is for 11 months. So, and then out of 11 months, we know that for eight months, there was no increase. So we're gonna have eight X. So eight represents the number of months without increase. And the increase was introduced on the 1st of November. So from November to January. So we don't count Feb because we haven't received the rent for Feb. So now from November to January, it's three months. And during this three months period, the increase was effected. So now we're going to add 3x and multiply by, so it's multiplication, so multiply by 110%. So guys, here we're going to solve for x. So x will give us the value of rent before increase. So now let's solve for x. It's not complicated, guys. So 67,800 equals to 8x plus. So now we're going to punch this part on the calculator. So three times 110%. So we write this as a decimal. So I'm getting 3,3. 3. So we have 3,3x. 3, so we are adding the like terms now. So 8 plus 3,3. 3, 8 plus 3,3. That is 11,3. Um, so it's 11,3 x. So guys, we want the value of x. So we want the value of x. So what are we going to do now? So we're going to divide by 11,3 on both sides so that we get the value of x. So we're going to divide by 11,3 on both sides. 
So divide by 11 comma 3. Divide by 11 comma 3. So now 11 comma 3 and 11 comma 3 cancels out. So now we are left with x. So x is equal to, we use the calculator, 67,800 divided by 11 comma 3. So I'm getting 6,000. So guys, 6,000 is the rent per month before increase. So this is the rent before increase. Meaning from March to October, the rent per month was 6,000. So that is before increase. And we know that in Feb, the rent was, in, was already increased. So for the rent for Feb, the rent that we're looking for, which is for Feb, should have an increase of 10% because the rent increased from November onwards. So we want the rent for Feb. So in Feb, the increase was already affected. So now it's simple, guys. Now we're going to calculate the rent for Feb. And we know that the rent for Feb should have increased. So the rent before increase is 6,000. So now we multiply this by 110 so that we get the increase. So 6,000 multiplied by 110%. I'm getting 6.6. Uh, .6. So the rent for Feb is 6.6. Six. So guys, we haven't received this rent, but we should record it because it was end during our financial period. It matches with our financial period. The fact that we haven't received the rent does not mean that we should not record it. We record it even though we haven't received it. So now we know that the rent for Feb that we haven't received is 6.6. .6. So we're going to add this accrued income. 6.6. .6. Guys, I hope that um, the calculation makes sense. Then let us do the next one. So additional information G. No entries have been made for stock stolen at the beginning of January 2019. The insurance company has informed No2 Limited that they have transferred 32,000 to the business bank account in respect of the insurance claim. Mutu Limited has to bear the stock loss of 20%. So guys, this one is straightforward. So at the beginning of January, the stock was stolen and we reported this to the insurance company and the insurance company made a transfer of 32,000 in respect of the insurance claim. So now, the 32,000 that was transferred by the insurance company represents the 80% of cost. So the insurance company did not pay the full cost, but they only um, paid 80% of the cost. How do I know? Because we are told that Ngotu Limited has to pay the stock loss of 20%. So 20% is on the company, is on Ngotu Limited, and the insurance company uh, paid only 80%. So now we should um, use this information to calculate the loss of stock due to death. So how are we going to do this? So I will show you the workings. Okay, let me use a new page. So here we want to calculate the loss. of stock to, to theft. So guys, we made the claim and the insurance paid us 32,000. So now guys, we should find the total cost of the stock that was stolen. So now, how do we get the full amount? 
So we take the 32,000 that was received from the, from the insurance company, we divide by 80% because we know that the amount only represents 80%, not 100%. So when we divide the, um, 82 by 80%, we will get the full amount. So how much is the full amount? 32,000 divided by 80%. is 40,000. So the value of the stock that was stolen is 40,000. But the only amount that was recovered from the insurance is 32,000. So the insurance only paid 32,000. But the value of the stock that was stolen is 40,000. So how much is the difference? So the difference here is the amount that was not recovered through the insurance claim. So 40,000 minus 32,000, that is 8,000. So this is the loss that the company will pay. Oh, guys, you can simply take the full amount of 40,000. So we said the value of the stock stolen is 40,000. And we are told that Mutu Limited has to pay a stock loss of 20%. You multiply this by 20%, still it gives you 8,000. So this 8,000 is the loss that the company has suffered. So 8,000 was not recovered by the company. Therefore, it is the loss. So we know the workings. So we're going to put them here. So it's 40,000 minus 32,000. And the loss of stock due to death is, due to death is 8,000. So guys, I hope I'm still making sense. Now let us do the next one. Okay, so for now, we're gonna skip H because this one deals with the loan. So we're gonna do the loan later. So let us go to I. The auditors are owed a further 1,600 for audit fees for this financial year. We are owing 1,600 to auditors. So we haven't paid them. So this is an accrued expense. So this is an expense that we have been paid for. So guys, remember the accrual basis principle. Expenses are recorded when they are incurred, not when cash is paid. So although we haven't paid the 19,600, so the balance is still outstanding. We are still owing. So this balance of 19,600, we are still owing it to auditors. And this is an expense that was incurred during our period. So it matches with our period. So we're going to apply the matching principle. So although we haven't paid the amount, because it was incurred during this financial period, we gonna record it, we gonna add it. So under audit fees, we gonna add 19,600. So we have audit fees, so we add 19,600. Then next one, so it's additional information J. The company had two directors on equal pay from 1 March 2018. A third director was appointed on the 1st of September 2018 on the same fee structure. So at the beginning of the period, the company had only two directors. And then on the 1st of September, the company said that the two appoint a third director. So this director's fee for Feb 2019 was not yet paid. We are owing director's fee for Feb. So guys, I will make this simple for you. So we have three directors. So we have director number one, director number two, and Director number three. So director number one and two worked from 1 March 2018 till the end of the financial period. So they worked for 12 months. So director number one works worked for 12 months. And director number two also worked from January to Feb. That is 12 months. But the third director, so director number three, 
did not work for 12 months because this one was appointed on the 1st of September. And then we are owing him a fee for Feb. So now from September to January, how many months is that? September, October, November, December, January. So this third director, we have paid him for five months. So we have only paid him for five months. Guys, I hope this is making sense. So director one and two, they worked the whole year. And director number three was appointed on the 1st of September. So from September to January, it's five months. So we don't count February because we are still owing him a fee for Feb. So now, guys, we're going to add 12, 12, and 5, and this will give us a base that we're going to use to calculate the amount or the fee that is paid to each director. So 12 plus 12, that is 24, plus 5, that is 29. So this 29 is our base that we're going to use. So this is the base that we're going to use to get the fee paid to each director. So now the amount that is given in the trial balance, director's fees amount, is um, here is director's fees. So in the trial balance, we have recorded the 551. So we have paid these directors 551. So there is still an outstanding balance that needs to be included in this balance. So we have 551,000. So now, we calculate the fee per director. The fee per director, we take 551.000, we divide by 29, which is our base, or you can say denominator. So now we punch this in the calculator, 551.000, divide by 29. So each director is paid 19,000. And guys, for director number three, we owe him a fee for Feb. So we haven't paid him his fee for Feb. Uh, for, for Feb. So now we know that per, month, per director we pay a fee of 19,000. So now we're gonna add this 19,000 because it is an accrued expense. So this is an accrued expense. So director's fees, we add 19,000, which is the balance that we haven't paid for the month of Feb to the third director. Okay, guys, we are almost done. So we are almost done. Then we have additional information K. An employee was omitted from the sales journal for Feb 2019. His details are as follows. So we are not given his gross salary and we have the list of his deductions, which is pay as you earn. Uh, so the list of his deductions includes pay as UN, pension fund, and medical aid. And we are told that the net salary is 65% of the gross salary. All right. So now this employee was omitted. So this was not recorded in the salaries journal. So guys, I will simplify this for you. So we have the gross Salary actions and net salary. So, guys, we are told that um, the net salary of this employee is represented by 65% of the cross. So, it's represented by 65%. And the cross is always represented by 100% because this is the full amount before deduction. And then deduction will be represented by, so you take the difference between 100 and 65. So the difference is 35%. So deductions is represented by 35%. And we do have the list of, of his deductions. So let us add all the deductions for this employee. So pay as you earn is 360, pension fund is 1,000 rand, and medical aid is 840. So total deductions is 4.9. So we have the total deduction, 
So now, guys, it's simple. Now we can use this to get the gross salary, and we can use this information to get the net salary. So let us first calculate the gross salary. So we are using 4.9. So 4.9, we want the gross salary. So the gross salary is represented by 100%. So it's 100 divided by, so we are using deduction, which is, which is represented by 35%. So we divide by 35. So 4.9 multi, uh, multiplied by 100 divided by 35. So I'm getting 14,000. For the gross salary is 14,000. So this is the full amount before any deduction. And then guys, we can also use the 4.9 to get the net salary. So we want the net salary now. So net salary is represented by 65. So 65 divided by, we are using 4.9, which is deduction amount, which is represented by 35%. So 65 over 35. So 4.9 times 65 over 35. So this 65 over 35. So I'm getting 9.1. So this is his net salary. So the salary that he gets after deduction. So now we can prove if this is correct. So 14,000 minus deductions of 4.9, it should give us 9.1. So guys, I hope you are following the calculation that I am doing here. So now the amount that we capitalize is the gross amount, the one before deduction. So this is the amount that we add to salaries, which is 14,000. Because this employee was omitted, so it means the salary for this employee was not recorded. So now we're going to record it. So we have salaries and wages, we add 14,000. And we are told that the employer makes contribution. So the employer contributes towards pension fund, which is to run for every one rand deducted. So to get the amount contributed by the employer, we take the amount deducted and we multiply it by two. So we multiply this by two. So it's gonna be 2,000 rands. So towards pension fund, the employer contributes 2,000. And towards medical aid fund, the employer contributes on a rent for rent basis. So this means the employer contributed the equal amount uh, deducted for medical aid. So the deduction for medical aid is 840. So the contribution made by the employer is also 840 because we are using a rent for rent basis. So the contribution made by the employer is the same or is equal with the amount deducted for medical aid. So medical contribution is 840. So we add 840. Then additional information L. The bookkeeper forgot to reverse the packing material at the beginning of the financial period. So there is a packing material that is given in the trial balance. So in the trial balance, we are given the packing material at the beginning of the year. So I want to show you. So this is consumable uh, consumables on hand, packing material on the 1st of March 2018, 810.20. So the bookkeeper forgot to reverse this. So how should this be reversed? We add the 820, that's a uh, is reversed. So this 20 should be added. So that's how we treat this. So now we are reading the last one. So guys, this is the last one. After taking all adjustments into account, the correct net profit after tax is 980. So the profit after tax is given. The income tax rate is 30% of the net profit before tax. So we are given income tax rate 30% and profit after tax 910.80.
So we have net profit after tax 980,000 and the tax expense is calculated at 30%. So guys to get the tax expense okay. Same thing applies here. The net profit before tax is represented by 100%. And then the tax expense, we are told that it is calculated at 30%, meaning the net profit is 70%. Why am I showing this? Guys, this helps us to easily calculate the tax expense. So having this information, we can get the tax expense and the net profit before tax. So now we want to calculate the tax expense. Mind you, we are using 980,000, which is the net profit after tax. And remember, the net profit after tax is represented by 70%. So we take 980, we multiply by, we want the tax expense. So tax expense is represented by 30%. So we do not divide by 100 because the amount that we are using is 980, which is represented by 70%. So we divide by 70. So that is how we correctly calculate the tax expense. So 980, the net profit of the tax, multiply by 80, divide by 70. So the tax expense is 420. So guys, this is an expense. We put it in brackets, 420. Okay, so now we want the net profit before tax. So net profit before tax, we take the 980,000, we multiply by, so we want the net profit before tax. So net profit before tax is represented by 100. So what we want becomes our numerator and what we have is our denominator. So here we have net profit which is represented by 7. So the net profit before tax is 1,400,000. So this is the profit after tax. So guys there are many ways you know that you you know you can apply to get this correctly. If you want you can also use the 420 tax expense to get the net profit before tax. So net profit before tax is represented by 100 and we are using the tax expense, which is represented by dead steel, you will get 1.4. Or you can work backward. So you take 980. If you work backward, you take 980, you add 420. Still, you get 1.4 million. That's the beginning. So this is the loan balance. So this is the loan statement. So this is the loan balance That's the beginning of the year, 725. Repayment of 10,000 per month, including interest. So for 12 months, the total is 120,000. So we are not given interest capitalized. So we're gonna, figure, we're gonna figure this out. Interest capitalized, we're gonna calculate it. And then we are told that the balance at the end of Feb 2019 is 648. So guys, I will use that account to explain this. So I will show you the T account, the ledger account. So interest expense, we can show working here. So seven, 68 minus seven, 25. Minus seven, 25. This gives us 43. So it is an expense, so we put it in bracket. Or else, guys, without you know having to prepare the T account, you can use another method to get the correct interest amount. So this method is simple. You just take the 725 and you subtract everything. You subtract 120,000, you subtract 648,000, and then boom, you have your 43,000. So I'm just using that account so that you can get the full understanding. So guys, um, let us finish up here. Okay, so guys, now remember, we are working backwards. So now we want to get this, uh, this one, operating profits before interest expense. So we have 
we have profits before tax and interest expense. So guys, when we work backward, we change the signs. So we have 1.4 million. So because we are working backwards, the 43,000 will be positive. We're gonna add it because we are working backwards. So the profits before interest expense is 1 million 443. So profits before interest expense is 1 million 443.0. And then do we have interest income? Remember, this is given in the trial balance. So we do have interest income. So that is interest on fixed deposit of 80,000. So no adjustment was given on this one. So we're gonna assume that this is the correct interest uh, income. So this is interest income, 80,000. So interest income, 80. So guys, we are working backwards. So this 80,000, we're gonna, okay, so because we're working backward, we're gonna take the 1443 triple zero, we subtract 80,000. So that we get the operating profit. So the operating profit is 1,363,000. Thousand. So now we're gonna total up our expenses. Okay, so this one is not given, so there's a question mark. So it means that depreciation will be calculated as the balancing figure. So this is the missing figure, so we're gonna calculate this as the balancing. So for now, I will put a question mark and then. Let us add up here, 4,400 plus 820. So this one will be 5,220. 5,220. Then we're going to add this one. Four eighty one six hundred plus. 14,000 plus 840. So, so this is for salaries and wages. Okay, so here, remember there is um, pension contribution that was made by the employer. So it seems like I did not add the 2,000, but I explained it, I remember explaining it here. So here we're told that the employer contributes two rand for every one rand deducted. And then I showed you the workings here that we're gonna take the 1,000 multiplied by two, and then the contribution made by the employer to, by the employer towards pension fund is 2,000. So this 2,000 was not added, so we should add the 2,000. Okay, so this one is given in the trial balance. 14,000 is the gross salary that we capitalized, 840 is the contribution towards medical aid, and 2000 is the contribution towards pension fund. So now we add everything. So plus 2000. So I'm getting 498440. Then we add director's fees, 551300 plus 19,000. So that is 570. And then audit fees, we add 188, 400, 19,600. So that is 208. Zero. Okay, we calculated the loss of stock due to death, 800, and then the balance for bad debts. So the balance for bad debts is 48,700. So the insurance balance was already 
a record guide in the booklet, so 14700. Okay, now let us total up our um, income. So we have rent income. So for rent income, we add 67,800 and 6.6. .6. So that is 74,400. 74,400. So 74,400 plus. 1.1, which is provision for bad debt. So I'm getting the total income of 75, uh, 75, And guys, when we add the gross profits and other operating income, we will get the gross income. So we will get this one so two six nine five triple zero plus seventy five five hundred so the cross income is two million seven hundred and seventy five hundred so the cross income is two million seven seven zero five hundred so guys, we are almost done. So now the next step is to get the total operating expenses. So how do we get that? So to get the total operating expenses, we take the gross income and subtract the operating profits. So the difference between gross income and operating profit will give us the total expenses balance. So 2770, 500 minus 136300. So the balance is 1,407,500. So this is the total for expenses. So operating expenses is one million four oh seven five hundred so guys now we want this balance depreciation balance so now it is simple so we're gonna take the total of one four zero seven five hundred then we subtract fourteen seven hundred subtract forty eight seven hundred subtract eight thousand subtract two oh eight Subtract 570, subtract 498, subtract 5220. Then the balancing figure is 54440. So the balancing figure is 54440. 54,440. So guys, we are done with the income statement. So now we have earned ourselves 40 marks. So 40 out of 40. So guys, I hope this will really help you as you prepare for your common test. So guys, please practice accounting. So this needs practice. If you don't understand anything, just uh, drop your question on the comment section and I will attend to your question. So guys, thank you and goodbye.